All right, hang on just a second. Okay, so what are you thinking? <coughs> Where did he go? What in the world's going on? Right? What's happening here? What is going on? I just like walked out on you. What are you thinking? <laughs> at least one person. We got it. All right. Right. Were you anxious? Were you wondering? I mean, did you? Or have you really learned who I am enough that you saw the sermon title and you just knew that that's what it was going to be? Boy, that's just, oh. That's what it is. It's, it's waiting, right? When something happens and we have to wait for it, we get anxious. Right? Be it an email or a phone call. Got to watch what you put on Facebook. If you're friends with me, it might wind up in a sermon. Right? What is it like to wait? And what is it like to wait, not only to wait, but to wait and to be prepared for what it is that we're waiting for? And what, if it, what is it if we don't know exactly what it is that we're waiting for, how we're going to be prepared? The only thing that I have in my life, well, I have a couple of things, but the thing that popped into my mind when I first started thinking about waiting, what it is to waiting is a first-time parent. How many of you parents, right? Waiting on that first child, right? You have to get everything ready, right? You have to paint the nursery, you have to paint the house, you have to get the, in the modern day, you know, you have to get the outlet covers for all your covers and put them on there. You have to get the, the cabinet locks and put them on the cabinets and you have to get the, the bumper rails for the corners, right? The big cushy things, so if they, right? All of us who are old enough that they didn't have those things, we all still survived. It was all still good. Our parents still prepared for us and was ready. But you have to prepare, right? You have to buy the car seat and put it in the car. This is, you can ask my, my wife. My, my wife's not here this morning, but you can ask her next week. You know, I was very persistent in making sure that the car seat was in the car to the point that it wasn't going to move. When we took it out three years later, there was still the indention in the seat from how tight it had been put into the car. You prepare for something, Right. Did we really have everything ready? Were we ready for that child? Were you ready for your first child when they came? Yeah, maybe. No, we weren't ready, right? Did something happen? We didn't know what was going on, and we weren't ready for that. As prepared as we were, we weren't ready. We weren't there. When it finally gets here, we don't get it, and we're not ready for what's going to happen. And then there's this whole waiting on Jesus thing. Paul wrote to the Thessalonians around 51 AD. Actually, the, the letter that we read this morning to the Thessalonians was written before the Gospel of Matthew was written down. It was written in 51 AD. The Gospel of Matthew was written a little bit later. But in about 51 AD, Paul wrote the words to the Thessalonians who were anxious because they were worried that those who had died were not going to get the be part of the promise. Because to them, the promise of Jesus' return was imminent, right? It was going to happen any day, like today. It's going to happen any day. But to them, it was fresh, because they had been there. They'd been with the people who had seen Him, or been with the people who had been touched by Him, and knew what it was like. They were in that first world where it was just fresh and new to them, and they were right there, anxious and waiting, and they were worried, right? Right? They were worried about it. And then Matthew comes along 30 years later, 20 to 30 years later, about 80, 90 A.D., 70, 80 A.D., Matthew was written. And they're still worried about it. Jesus is telling the story about what it is to wait, what it is to be prepared, 
Because at some point, it's all going to happen and the kingdom's going to be fulfilled and it's all, we need to be ready for it. And are we ready? And us today, we're still waiting for Jesus, right? It's going to happen anytime. How many of you are ready? How many have your oil and your lamp, your wick? If Jesus walked through that door right now, what would you do? What? Be afraid? Start praying? It's a little late. When he walks through the door, it's a little late to start praying. <laughs> I'd say, if you pray when you see him, it's a little late. That's, you know, you're not prepared, right? The Boy Scouts are always prepared. But I don't think we would be prepared for that moment. I don't know if we're ready. We say we're ready for that moment. I'm ready to see Jesus. I really am. But are we really ready? Are we really waiting? Are we really prepared? Do our lives really show that each day, in and out, what we live for is the fact that Christ is coming back? But what are we waiting for? Each of us is waiting for something, right? Emails, phone calls, checks in the mail. Like I said, if you're friends with me on Facebook, you've got to watch what you post. It might wind up in a sermon. We're waiting for something. A call from a family member or a friend who we had an argument with and we're waiting for them to call us to make amends. A call from a doctor on test results for the pain of loss to end. To hear from our college that we really want to get into. To hear from that job that we've applied for and we're waiting to hear back. We all know what it's like to wait. Each and every one of us this morning could probably name at least one thing that we're waiting for. We're all waiting for something. And we're not alone in this. Whether it's good news or bad news makes no difference. Waiting includes anxiety. It includes stress. And the other thing that our gospel passage this morning tells us is that we're not alone in this because Jesus is right there with us. Right? When Jesus told this parable to His disciples, where was He? Give you a hint. It's a big city. Across the, across the seas. Where? Jerusalem. He was in Jerusalem. What had happened a few days before this? The triumphal entry. Where in Matthew, he rode into the, the city on the donkey and a colt of the donkey. Right? The triumphal entry has already happened. He's been welcomed into the city. Palm Sunday has passed. He's now waiting. He's waiting to go to the cross. And he knows exactly where he's going and he knows exactly what he's waiting for. There's no mystery in this at all. But yet he still has to wait for it. See, we're not alone. He's already been there. He's entered the city triumphantly. He's now telling the disciples what's going to happen and preparing them as he himself anxiously waits for that day to come when they're going to nail him to the cross. He's waiting, and He knows full well it's going to happen and it's going to come. He still knows what it is to be in that in-between time, though, and what it is for us to wait on something. So then how do we live our lives and wait and prepare for Jesus to come? Because it's not just waiting for Jesus to come back. We need to be prepared, right? There was ten bridesmaids. Five got in, five didn't. Five were wise, five were foolish. I really want to know where the five that were foolish were supposed to go at midnight to buy oil for their lamps. Even in today's age, it would be far hard to find oil at midnight for a lamp. Of course, you could go to Walmart, so Walmart's always open, right? You could get it. But it's still, you have to go and get it. You have to be prepared. So we have to wait. Because Jesus' return is... Thank you. Imminent. Right. Any time now. Jesus could come back. He could walk through that door right now. And we're going to start praying. (laughs) Jesus' imminent return is going to happen. Jesus is coming back. And there are opportunities all around us to wait and be prepared. Each day. Every day. When we work for justice, as Amos tells us, we show Jesus is with us. When we help those in need, we show Jesus is with us. When we advocate for the poor, Jesus is with us. When we reach out to the lonely or the friendless, 
We show that Jesus is with us. When we work to make this world a better place, even in our own little corner, we show that Jesus is with us. When we fill a shoebox and send it to some way halfway across the world, we show that Jesus is with us. And we show that we're preparing for the fact that He is coming back. And is that easy? It's easy to fill a shoebox. But is it easy to fight for justice and work for justice? Is it easy to help the poor? Is it easy to help the needy? Is it easy to help the friendless? The answer to that is yes and no. Because yes, it is easy. But no, it's not easy because we don't see the results we get, we want. We get weary, we get frustrated because we lack to see the outcomes that we wish we could see. We want to see the fruits of our labors, right? We're not going to see the fruits of our labors here. Some of us will because some of these have the labels on them so you can track them. But still, you're not going to see it. You're going to know where it went. But you're not going to see what this does for that family, what it does for that, this one, for that little girl. Right? And we get frustrated and we get wearied and we get downhearted and we get distracted by everything else around us that's happening in our lives because how many of us have other things to worry about other than preparing for Jesus' return? And you can be honest because I have my hand up. Right? There's other things in our lives that get in our way. We, can't, we, we, we need to be focused on Jesus, but we can't. Because everything else gets in the way. And Jesus understands that, but He still wants us to be focused on Him. Because as we heard last night at SYG, I want you all to ask the SYG kids too when they come back about their experience. We heard last night from one of the men who was on The Biggest Loser, um, season 13, was the, was the keynote speaker for the event. And he, because he's a youth pastor in Texas. He came to talk about it. He talked about how he learned how to surf. And when you surf, you don't look at the the ground around you. We don't look at ourselves. Because when we look at at our board and we look at ourselves and we're standing here and we're trying to watch the waves, we're going to get knocked down because we compensate for this side, but we don't see what's coming over here. The only way to surf is to find a spot on the shore that's not going to move. And what is that spot that we need to look at on the shore? Jesus. And if you can see Jesus, he's not going to move. And then you compensate for what's happening around you because of what you see looking at Him. You have to be focused and look up and wait and prepare and know that He's not going to leave you nor forsake you. That He's always going to be right there to guide you and to help you, to give you everything that you need. Right? We can't be distracted. We on any given day are both the prepared and the unprepared bridesmaid. So let us reclaim one of the reasons that we gather here every morning. Right? We can be the unprepared bridesmaids. We don't have the stuff that we need and we can't carry on. So why do we gather here on Sunday morning? Well, because this is what we've always done. Yes, because we come to church because we feel good about it. Yes, but we come here to help each other and to support each other. Because if we're out there alone with just Jesus, it's going to be really hard. Not to say that Jesus isn't enough, because He is. But Jesus gave us each other for a reason. We're here to support and to help each other. With all the kinds of waitings that we do. Not just as the body of Christ waiting for Jesus, but the waiting that we do all around us. For the checks in the mail, for the emails to come. For the doctors to call with the test, for our kids to call to tell us that they got to wherever they're going safely, for the college that we want to get into to send us the note, for the job that we've applied for to send us back something about what we're what we're looking for. All of those kinds of waitings, we're here to support each other, to be a support for each other in our daily lives as Christians. This is why Paul ended his letter to the Thessalonians. Go back and read it again later. Who had a hard time waiting. Therefore, encourage one another. Paul said to the Thessalonians, who had a hard time waiting for what Jesus was coming back, when Jesus was coming back, he said, encourage one another, help each other, be there for each other, lift each other up. And that is what we are to do as a body of Christ, and that's one of the reasons why we gather. We sit in vigil with each other during time of pain, loss, or bereavement. We celebrate achievements with each other. We console each other through disappointments. We are a source of hope to those around us when we can't possibly see the hope ourselves. We've all been in that dark, deep valley. And thankfully, we've had friends around us to help us, to hold us, and to lead us. 
to remind us that Christ is always with us, to lift our eyes up so that we can see Jesus and not look down at ourselves. We are the body of Christ here to help others, to wait, to prepare, to help each other keep the faith. We can encourage one another with the promise of Christ and support each other as we wait on Jesus and everything else in our daily lives. So keep the faith and prepare as we wait with each other for the return of Jesus because it is going to happen. He's coming back. It's a promise that we've been given and I believe it. We just have to wait for it. And that's hard. But if we can support each other and help each other when we're the foolish bridesmaid, we can know that we are there all the times and that God is always going to be with us and that we have the support of our surrounding body and our friends and family here. And God will be with us through the waiting. And we can show everyone exactly how much He loves us and how much mercy and grace He has for all the world. Amen.